Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so I wanted to ask everybody to please exercise your tweeting uh, skills. This is the hashtag for for the uh, for the conference. Uh, feel free to mention any other uh, tags, <laughs> and uh, please stop us if you have questions. Uh, we we love for these things to be to be interactive, if at all possible. So, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about COVID nineteen related new codes that came out uh, in the last year and a half and how we sort of went about dealing with them. So at the steady state, uh, we usually do annual terminology refreshes at Trinetics. We use UMLS as our main source. It's really convenient uh, because the, the format is harmonized. We know exactly how to get the content out. You know, you basically pick a root of your terminology of interest, be that ICD or CPT or LOINC, you build a hierarchy and it's uh, it's really nice to have truly a blessing to, to have such such a resource from the National Library of Medicine. Uh, many countries don't have anything like this. We use a second annual release. So UMLS releases twice a year. The second one comes in November, it's called AB. So the last one, for example, is 2020 AB. And that's our main source. Uh, it's also convenient because we're doing consolidated privacy review of the codes. We do it once a year and uh, it's, uh, it's done. Exception is medications. Those things churn a lot more, as you know, than other standards. Uh, and there's a lot of focus on drugs. And so we refresh medications quarterly. We do it straight from Rx norm by downloading files. Now, obviously, uh, about a year and a half ago, pandemic began and things, things changed. So the harbingers were, and I'm actually gonna bring up this, it has, it has this interesting stark look to it. So the harbinger was the U07.1, a WHO code, no, not, not ICD-10-CM, but the, uh, the WHO version of ICD-10, which became effective in the States, they first said it's going to be on a regular schedule, so end of 2020, and then it became apparent that we would need that code much sooner. And so CDC announced its availability on April 1st. Uh, and then very quickly after that, on the 26th of March, Loing put out a webinar talking about their new COVID-19 related codes. It was a fantastic, uh, fantastic resource. Um, if you haven't seen it, I, I suggest you look at it. Uh, really sort of very carefully laid the foundation for what Loing was doing. And Loing was one of the, the most important resources when it comes to new codes uh, during this pandemic. And obviously, this was just the beginning. Um, by, uh, per, per Jim's suggestion, I wanted to talk a little bit about how do you go about finding the new codes that were being released on a regular basis. And so there were new codes across, across our usual terminology domains, diagnosis, procedures, meds, labs, vaccines, etc. Uh, the downside of all, so obviously the, the, the pro is that there were a lot of new codes being released and uh, we could use them to capture very important uh, aspects of this, uh, of this pandemic and the state of the patients and the treatment. The downside was that there was no centralized resource where you could go and find all of these new codes. So I think all of us were sort of on a continuous hunt to you know to, to find which codes are becoming available and to kind of scramble to make sure our systems are kept up to date with these new codes. So let me take you on a quick tour of some of these. When it comes to diagnosis, uh, CMS maintains a website. So there are versions of, of, uh, of the standard by year and you can download um, some some resources here. It's again 
it still requires a lot of hunting and picking. Uh, if, if memory serves, I usually download one of these zip, uh, zip files that contain a summary of the changes. There's a ton of files in each one of those archives. You look for one that indicates whether a code was added, changed, or deleted, and then you evaluate the added codes to see if it makes sense, uh, if they're COVID-related, and if it makes sense to urgently update your systems with that. ICD-10 PCS, same, same website maintained by, uh, by CMS. CPT, obviously, uh, AMA uh, has those resources. They've been fairly consistent about publishing uh, blog posts and notices about new codes. So here's a page that lists new codes kind of in the chronological order as they were adding them and explaining what they are for and how they are to be used. Uh, this came about sort of halfway through the, uh, the pandemic. In the beginning, it was less organized, but now there's this nice page where you can get a summary of all the COVID-19 related uh, CPTs. Let's see, what else is of interest? HitPix looks pretty similar to ICDs, also maintained by CMS. There are some new SNOMED codes that, that are related to vaccine administration, et cetera. Uh, I don't have a link for that, but should be easy enough to find. Uh, RxNorm put together a very nice, oh, no, we will not start the survey. A very nice uh, review of all the new codes that it's been adding for COVID-19 related drugs. Uh, if you want a summary, that's, that's, a, that's a good place to go. And then obviously Loing with the largest volume of new codes has this very nice page that details all the new codes when they were released. Um, and you can, this is, this is a good resource. If you're looking to make sure that your system is up to date uh, with COVID-19 related lab codes, they've organized things really nicely. Um, they also do, I would say, a much better job than other standards in terms of disseminating this information. So you can subscribe to uh, email that will come out and announce new codes. There's actually an RSS feed that you can monitor. I certainly do. Uh, and uh, they, they've made it very easy uh, to, to stay up to date. And kudos, kudos to long folks on that one. And then of course, when it comes to vaccines, um, CVX uh, maintained by the CDC, here's a, here's a website and very nice table here, very easy to use. Uh, this is, this groups vaccines uh, by, by different disease. And if you scroll down far enough, you will find, uh, 213 and related, here we go, related COVID vaccines. So CVX, uh, this is where, this is where you, you go to find uh, the new ones as they get added. And uh, another very good resource that I would recommend uh, actually happens to be on AMA's website. These guys put together vaccine related codes that span multiple data domains. So you have a CPT code uh, for, for vaccine. You have vaccine administration CPTs. You, uh, if you're familiar with these things, you've, you've come across these already. So for example, here's a code for Pfizer vaccine, and then there's a code for administering first dose, administering second dose, right? They also brought together NDC codes. So here's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty useful summary of, um, vaccine-related coding. So the task is to monitor these things on an ongoing basis. Uh, there are other sources, this, etc. cetera. Uh, I meant to say that other, other sources exist um, and we've been, we've been beneficiaries of other people's work. And uh, on more than one occasion, we were finding out about new codes, not just from these sources, but from others sharing the new codes that they find, or even from customers asking us for data with brand new codes that, that we were not even aware of. So this, this, is, this is definitely sort of taking a village to keep up to date with these new codes. Um, 
internally we were we were trying to even go a little farther in terms of summarizing the available data so here's my take on that ama summary of vaccine information so you have rx norm codes ndc codes cvx codes procedure codes for the vaccine for the administration and as you can imagine this table goes uh goes uh, much farther down but these this became important to be able to sort of organize your own thoughts around these new data elements and to inform others about the availability uh, and uh, various issues and deficiencies uh, that arise when you are working with the data. So I mentioned that I threw together and maintained over the last over the last uh, year or so this spreadsheet. You're more than welcome to use it. It basically reflects the new codes that Trinetics was adding to our terminology as the pandemic went on. So these, as far as we know, are new COVID-19 related codes. Um, and you know, I'm planning to planning to continue keeping it up to date if new ones become available. So let's take a quick look at these. Obviously, in the diagnosis realm, we have the U07, which everything began with. Uh, U09 is is being threatened uh, any any day now. This is a strangely strangely named so far code, but it's really meant for long COVID. There were other codes that were added: uh, pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome uh, as one of them, and other COVID nineteen uh, related diagnosis codes that you should be aware of. Uh, Procedures, there's a bunch of ICD-10 PCS codes for both um, treatment administration as well as vaccine administration. We don't see a heck of a lot of use of this in the field, but these codes exist and uh, you should be aware of them. I don't think I have any special comments about this suffice to say it's a long it's a long list of these things uh cpts we kind of glanced at them on ama website just a second ago but here they are all together so again spanning uh procedure codes for testing uh procedure codes for administering treatment and administering vaccines and uh these will probably these will probably grow with time. Uh, Hickpix also added uh, a bunch of codes, again covering covering testing, treatment, uh, the, the usual sort of the usual domains that that Hickpix, uh, is responsible for. And as I mentioned, a couple of SNOMED codes that uh, um, in in our world we're using SNOMED practically exclusively for procedures. So this, this focuses on, uh, on the procedure subtree of SNOMED and the added codes for, for vaccine administration. And then kind of for completeness sake, I didn't want to list out all the new links. Uh, there happened to be over 130 of them and obviously all the new ARCS norms, but these are links to very well-organized uh, resources that, that, these, that these folks maintain on their own websites. So we'll make these slides available and hopefully a table like this is going to, to be useful. Um, again, this is something I've been, I've been keeping or trying to keep up to date. I don't make any representations as to its uh, completeness, but it certainly proved to be uh, very useful. Uh, in my brief update, I mentioned this Ontologies 101 lecture from last conference that we transcribed. So it is on, on the community wiki. Let me just go to this page. It's a little difficult to find. Uh, if you arrive to the wiki itself, uh, what you have to do is go to working groups and then click ontology working group, either here in the main page or look on the site panel. And uh, there's a link to ontologies 101. Uh, if you if you recall the um, 
what I was trying to talk about last year is basically very pragmatic guide on how the ontology is organized and how to add to it. So kind of the actionable piece of this is as you discover these new codes and uh, become aware of them and realize that you need to support them in your systems, this should help you to actually add it into your, into your I2B2 instance. Uh, and obviously the members of the ontology work group are uh, available for, for any questions. We're, we're more than happy to, to help you with any of these, uh, with any of these aspects. And then the last slide, I, I uh, you know, wanted to make it slightly pseudoscientific. Um, so it's fine and good to keep track of these new codes and to be as inclusive as possible and to make sure we don't miss any and to collect them all and to update our systems. I think it's crucially important. We can't really not do it, right? Uh, every, and everybody uh, from the from folks who maintain EMRs to folks who maintain research repositories and the networks of these research repositories, we got to make sure that we are geared up to support this data. On the flip side, there is a big difference between the interface terminology and what actually comes in in the data. And so I counted how many distinct lowing codes for COVID people use. Again, remember there were over 130 uh, that Loink released. And guess what I found? Uh, searching like a lot of sites. The median number of COVID-19 related Loinks in the data is two. Um, but it's there and uh, it's no excuse not to uh, hunt and peck and build out the terminology so they are representative and cover and cover all the codes. So that's uh, that's my spiel. Uh, are there any questions? So Matt, uh, I have a question. So that, that was uh, a very good overview of uh, like one person collecting all these new codes. Um, is there a plan to kind of maybe make a public GitHub repo where uh, maybe one page just lists these resources and then there's another page which has got some version of your uh, spreadsheet? Thank, thank you, Shem. So uh, first of all, it's if I made it sound like it was a one person show, my apologies, there's a team of folks and uh, I relied, I relied on the team at Trinetics as well as other teams, like for example, N3C, um, uh, phenotyping group in ongoing conversations throughout the year. To answer your question, I'd be more than happy to, to do this. I'm personally not technical enough. I, uh, I have a vague idea of, of the sort of the, the goodness of GitHub, uh, but more than happy to, uh, to do anything, anything that, that that needs to be done to make it more available. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess uh, I think between ACT and the I2B2 ontology working groups, we can set up a GitHub. It's, it's just focused on uh, tracking these codes and maybe even add additional information like when was the code introduced and when it was maybe disbanded and things like that. Indeed. Okay. Indeed.